Thank you, ladies. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Acts chapter 19? So much appreciate the beautiful messages and music that we have each and every week. And um, God is just truly moving in a great way. In just a moment, we're going to be reading in Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse uh, 11. You know, the city of Ephesus was a very significant city back in biblical times. It was the capital city of the Roman province called Asia Minor. Uh, it was an entertainment mecca, really. Uh, there's been debate as to how big the amphitheater was. Some said 25,000, some 50,000, but one of the largest arenas in that known time existed there in Ephesus. It was a religious center. Uh, the temple to Artemis or Diana was there. It was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Uh, Artemis was a very interesting uh, fictional goddess. She was recognized as the goddess of the hunt, the wild animals, the wilderness, vegetation, childbirth, child care. She had all of it covered, I guess. But she was considered to be the daughter of the fictional god Zeus and considered to be a goddess of health and healing, especially to women and children. Also, Ephesus was located near a harbor, so it was a very strategic uh, trade area. So you had an intellectual area, you had uh, entertainment, you had religion, you had trade. Really, anything you might desire, you could find in Ephesus. However, if you were to Google Ephesus, one of the first things you would see is that Ephesus was a place where there was a great movement of Christianity. We'll see today it was not always that way. However, Paul, as we know, visited Ephesus. John visited Ephesus. There was much thought that even Jesus' mother Mary had visited this city. And so it's considered to be a great center for Christianity. But last week we saw as Paul entered the city, there was a lot of misunderstanding. When Paul arrived, there was not much knowledge about who Jesus was, but he took care of that. And so today we see that Paul is continuing the work of evangelizing. And that is a work that God has given every single one of us to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. Look with me at Acts chapter 19, verse 11. It says that God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Now some of the itinerant or traveling Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid. And the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was held in high esteem. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. While many of those who had practiced magic collected their books, that is, their books of spells, and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver in this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. Let us pray. Father, as we open your word today, help us to understand the power, the magnetic power, Lord, of a distinct life, of the life of a Christian who in his or her workplace, at home, wherever, would be distinct from those around. Lord, you've called us to be salt and light. And Lord, in order for each to be effective, it must be distinguished from its environment. And so, Lord, help us as we seek to be a witness through life and through word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, Paul briefly visited Ephesus at the end of his second missionary journey. In fact, he left Aquila and Priscilla there with great intentions. And so now in his third missionary journey, he's returning to Ephesus. As I said a few moments ago, Ephesus is considered, as historians look back, to be really a central location of Christianity. But we see here in the last verse that I just read that the word of the Lord began to spread and prevail through the ministry that Paul had there. So it wasn't just that Christianity happened, there was an intent that Paul had that the gospel be carried there. And really that intent began with God and we see today it happened through the ministry of Paul. And so months later, after Paul had briefly visited on his way back to Antioch following the second journey, after he left Aquila and Priscilla there, he returns and stays for some two years. He, he began his ministry in the synagogue as we saw last week and then uh, he, re he, he faced such opposition that he decided to move to Tyrannus' Hall, a different venue, and he continued to carry the gospel and he did it as we saw through teaching and preaching and through dialogue. And so today I want to look at this second event, this second narrative that we see uh, describing what happened as Paul was in Ephesus. And we're going to see that there were great miracles that were being performed by the hand of the apostle under the power of God. We're going to also see that there were a group of people who thought by just trying to emulate uh, the wordings, the incantations, that they would be able to do the same. And, and we see that their work was fruitless. But very importantly, we're going to see the response of the people. And I appeal to you today, uh, as we look at this text, that the people responded to the gospel because they saw something different in the Christian. They saw what those who were not believers were trying to do, and they saw the Christian Paul and the outworking of his life, and, it, and they drew the conclusion that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true God. And you know, whether you have handkerchiefs or aprons, whether you pray over them, send them through the mail or whatever, the truth of the matter is this. A, a life that is distinct as a Christian is a powerful life. And God can use that life. And we're going to see a specific example at the end. And so this morning, I want to look at the real we're going to see what Paul did. We're going to look at the fake, those that tried to uh, carry out what he was doing without the power of God, and then the response. First, the real. God performed extraordinary works through the ministry of Paul. That's interesting. It tells us there in verse 19 that there were extraordinary miracles. That seems almost a redundant because a miracle in and of itself is extraordinary. Uh, by its very definition, a miracle is not the ordinary work of God. But this was an extraordinary, extraordinary. In other words, it was extraordinary in this. In most of the miracles of that day, there might be a word spoken by Jesus or an empowered apostle, or there might be a physical touch that directly. But what happened here was an indirect contact. They were taking aprons, work aprons that were tied when, when Paul did his tent making work, handkerchiefs that were used to wipe the sweat of his brow, and they were taking those indirect objects and people were touching them and they were being healed. They were being healed of physical infirmities, they were being healed from spiritual bondage, and through the conduct this was happening. And so Luke here, as he's writing Acts, says that it was an extraordinary, extraordinary. In other words, the miracles themselves were extraordinary, but even in regard to miracles, this was an extraordinary thing. And I think it's at this point that we need to make a few points, and it's this. Miracles still happen. Miracles still happen. Uh, every time an individual is saved, that is a miracle. That is a spiritual transformation. Someone who is physically and spiritually, physically on the way toward death, spiritually dead, being transformed into life. But God performs many other miracles today. Uh, my favorite preacher, you hear me quote him all too often, uh, probably, but Adrian Rogers, he says this, believe in miracles 
but trust in Jesus. You know the difference? Believe in it, but your trust is in Jesus. Even better than a miracle worker, and one who believes in miracles is one who believes in Jesus. Remember Thomas, he missed that first post-resurrection appearance. And all the disciples were telling him, boy, if, if, if you had been there, man, you would have seen. And, and Thomas says, I will not believe unless what? I place my fingers in his nail prints, in, in the nail prints, then I will believe. But when he saw Jesus, that next Sunday, without even doing that, he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said this to him, you believe because you have seen my hands and feet. More blessed are they who do not see yet believe. What is Jesus saying there? For the person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ without needing the impetus of some miraculous supernatural work, that one has a faith that is to be commended. So we believe in miracles but we trust in Jesus. There's a second truth in regard to miracles as we're looking at this miracle today. Now, we do not seem to witness as many miracles today as people used to see, or for those who have been in third world countries, as you might see in a country where the gospel is not as prevalent. And I see really two reasons for that. I know there may be many. But simply put, we live in an educated world. We live in a rational world. We live in a world today that seeks to explain everything. And usually you don't find what you're not looking for. And that is one reason. But there's also a second reason, and this is a positive reason that is very important for us to understand. We live in a day today when the Bible is complete. We have the full revelation of God. And so as we have the revelation of God, this is our authority. Many times miracles that would happen in biblical times, they would authenticate or say this is the authoritative uh, work of God and they were needed as signs in order to do that. But today we have the authoritative word of God. Many times, as I said, you go into third world countries where the word of God is not there and you may see many miracles. In fact, when I was in one country, a lady came and asked me to pray and the minister there said, please pray fervently. She's from a faith that is not of the Christian faith and this can be an impetus for her. And so I prayed over her. But in the United States, we have the Word of God. Think about this for a moment. Remember in Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus, which is a little event, not a parable, because nowhere in a parable do you see a proper name like Lazarus given. But you remember Abraham, Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom, which was heaven. He was with Abraham. And the rich man died and he went to hell. And he was in torment and the rich man was begging. And when he finished begging for himself and wasn't able to get any relief, he appealed to Abraham who was in heaven. And he said, please send people from the dead to go and tell my brothers that hell is a real place. And what did Abraham say to him? They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. We have the Word of God that's authoritative. This Word that you read, hopefully that you study, has a power that doesn't need anything to stand alongside of it to verify it. But I want you to see a third truth. Not only do miracles still happen, not only do we not see them as often, maybe as would happen in some parts of the world and, and as formerly happened, but I want you to see very simply these miracles were simple manifestations of the work of God through Paul. And we can't miss verse 11. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands. Very simply put, if we can separate out handkerchiefs and aprons, God was working through Paul. God was doing the work. That's why when these seven sons of Sceva who saw what happened and thought they could come up with the magic formula of, of in the same one as Paul preached about Jesus trying to cast out and they weren't able to, the problem was they weren't doing it the way Paul was doing it. God was working through Paul. And do you realize this? He can work through you and me. 
I'm going to share an illustration again that is a very poignant illustration. I think it will make it very clear, but we must agree God can work through you and me. And it may or may not be through the miraculous. In fact, again, by definition, the miraculous is the not ordinary. Do you think God would have created you in his image, that God would have saved you and then said to you, I'm not going to use you in your ordinary life. I'm just going to use you to do extraordinary things. You're going to do all of these things. You're going to walk around. No, God created you in your ordinary life to be able to make an impact for him. Last week we looked, I referenced a book and I promised John Parker I'm going to get him a copy and I will. Baptism in Fullness by John R. W. Stott. One, I received it when I was involved in an InterVarsity Christian Fellowship when Eric and I were involved in it years ago at Hampton, Sydney. In that book I've read through a number of times and Stott writes, the real proof of a deep work of the Spirit in a person is neither subjective emotional experience, not that someone hears and they, they just have chills down their spines and emotional experience. It's not that, nor spectacular signs, but moral Christ-like qualities. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is the evidence that God is working in your life, in my life. When God works through you to produce not miraculous works, well, I can do it, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and these things are in a developing and in an abounding manner, then that is an evidence. And it has both a supernatural influence because it's not you pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps and making yourself a better person because it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's a supernatural work, but it is also a natural work that happens over time, even as fruit uh, progresses. And so Stott says that we can make a difference. Let me ask you, did people see a difference in your life? When people were looking at Paul, they said, wow, th th this guy's a man of God. They looked at the others, they said, th th these guys aren't the real deal. Do they see evidence of the Spirit's work in and through your life? Are you sensitive to the Spirit in just such a timely way that you're right there at that moment? And in our text, we see that the people here that came to the conclusion at the end, they were saying, I want what Paul has. But before we get to those people, let's look at the fake. We've seen the real. Paul was the real one. God was working through Paul. People were, were healed miraculously, even by touching the garments that touched Paul. But along with that, we see the fake, and they're described in verses 13 through 16. I call these uh, the attention seekers. They were futile and powerless and defeated, these seven sons who tried to emulate the works of Paul. I, we might call them charlatans. Charlatan is a term that's not coined often in, in, in our lingo today, but a charlatan is basically a fake. It's a person or a group that tries to present something that they are, but they're truly a fraud, falsely claiming to have a, a, a knowledge or a skill that is unique to them. There are a lot of charlatans today, and let me appeal to you uh, deeply here. Be careful of what you watch on the television. A lot of what you see are charlatans. And uh, think, is this consistent with the Lord Jesus Christ? When you see all the candelabras and the millions of dollars and you see all of the show, you begin to think, would Jesus have presented himself that way? That's all I'm saying. Just be alert to these things. So in our text today, we find these charlatans. What, what happened? They were looking at the works of Paul, and, and they were itinerant exorcists. In other words, it was their practice to go and do what Paul had just done in a great way. And they were amazed. Why do we know they were amazed? Because they sort of dropped everything they were doing, and they said, in the name of the Jesus that Paul pre 
preached, we tell you to do this. And so uh, they were fakes. They were performing these incantations, thinking that they could get rid of magic spells, that they could accomplish these things. They were trying to emulate. It reminded me once when I was in a third world country and, and we were visiting an area and there were octopi hanging all outside of the home, just raw octopi that had recently died. And they hung them out thinking that they would keep the evil spirits away. These exorcists, they tried everything externally they could do. They had down all the outwards. They had the right words, but they had no power. They gave the appearance they were spiritual, but they weren't. And the demon paid them no mind. The evil spirit said in verse 15, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul. I don't know who in the world you are. And then the man who possessed the evil spirit pounced on them, chased them naked out of the city. Think how humiliating that was. They were embarrassed totally. They were literally humiliated. They didn't have the power of God. Listen, you and I, if you're a Christian today, you need to walk in the power of God. You need to be clothed with, with the armor of God every day. What people need to see is not you, but the God who is in you. And so we see it today. Two, one an individual, one a group that, that confronted evil spirits. One calmly removed them. And there's no stress. The others were run out of town in humiliation. Now, if you were witnessing that then, what would you want a part of? I would want what Paul had. And when people look at you and me, they should say, I want what Noah has. I want what Paul has. I want what Becky has. They should say, they should see in us a distinction because people are making that measurement all the time and we don't realize it. They are <clears throat> observing what's happening and they're looking at us and they're looking at those who aren't Christians and they're making a measurement. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not minimizing miracles at all. They happen. But I'm telling you this, that's the extraordinary. What God is concerned with is the ordinary in your life. The most ready distinction in all likelihood in your life is going to be a life that depicts the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, the concern, the sensitivity. Paul's hands were during the works of God. The seven sons of Sceva, the Jewish priest, their hands were doing their own work. And there is a distinction in a life that is yielded to God. Wouldn't you yield to him today and say, God, work through me. I, I'm not that fancy. I'm not all that. But God, work through me. You know, Peter also spoke of the distinction. He said, they, observers of your life in 1 Peter 4, 4, they think it's strange that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living. When you're on the workplace and they are sharing their vile, vile stories and, 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 and escapades and all of that and you don't participate, they see, they know that you're distinct. And that leads really to the third group here. The response, the crowd. They were amazed and they repented. You know, there's a reason that when you Google Ephesus, it says that there was a tremendous Christian influence there because we're seeing it happen. As we look back here in Acts chapter 19, people were observing Christians and they were saying, I want to be Christians. And then as they lived, there were others who said, I want to be a follower of Christ. It tells us in verse 17, the crowd was amazed. Look at this. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, man, you can't keep a secret, especially when people are running around naked. Both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. There were two things now. The first was, whoa, he ran these people out. But then word came, but there's one greater. Paul had a power that was greater. And so the people feared, but then they said, but boy, this Jesus, 
He must be real. When people are observing your life and they see compassion and they see joy and they see love and they see genuine concern, then they're saying, boy, the Christ those people serve is real. And so they held the name of the Lord Jesus in high esteem. But I want you to see it didn't stop there. This ball was rolling in verse 18. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. Uh, 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. These people were coming and they were confessing what they had done wrong. They owned up to their wrongful practices, seeing God work and realizing the holiness of God. They said, we're not like that. We confess all of our sin. And they did it publicly. But it didn't stop there. Verse 19. While many of those who had practiced magic. So there were many people being saved. And among the many, there were many in that group who were involved in the magic arts. Who were involved in witchcraft probably and casting out and casting spells and removing spells, all of these books that they studied that were not of God, that were of the dark realm, it says that they collected them all together and they had a book burning party. They, they got rid of all of the books and the scripture says there were so many books at such a great value that there were 50,000 pieces of silver. We don't know whether it was the Greek drachma or the Roman denarius. We can't tell exactly the amount, but the very fact that it was 50,000 pieces of silver says there was a lot of money. What did they do? They repented. They said, we are done with this. Now follow why they did that. They saw the power of God manifest through one man versus seven other individuals. They saw the power of God manifest through one man and they realized that it was greater and more worth their while to follow the way of the one than it was the way they knew. And so what did they do? They said, we are done with doing this life the way we have done it. We want to follow Christ. And people will do that when they see God in and through a life. What great impact could God make through a solitary life? Well, let me share with you. And I'll tell you this, while it could involve the use of second points of contacts like hand, handkerchiefs and aprons, most all of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it does not happen that way. There's a man named Harold Morris. He passed away June 14th, 2017 at the age of 79. Harold Morris wrote a book back when Eric and I were in college. It is the first Christian biography I can remember reading. It was called Twice Pardoned. Harold Morris had an interesting life that had a, a vast turn in his life. He was a successful businessman, was married, and then through his own wrong actions, he brought about divorce. Then he began to live wildly. He was involved in all types of activities, heading to seedy joints, doing all of the wrong things, and began to hang around the wrong people. One night, he was with two so-called friends, and as they traveled, he thought his friends were going into a convenience store, and so he was driving the car. The two friends actually robbed the store. One of the friends, and I use that word loosely, killed a person in the store. They got in the car. He did not know what happened. They said, get out of here, and he began to drive. He drove all the way from Georgia into central North Carolina, and later he was caught. And as he was called, he was charged with the crime. You see, his two so-called friends conspired to blame him to say that he was the one who did the killing. And so as a result, they received leniency and served very little time. He received two life sentences. He became very hardened. In, a, in an ironic way, 
There was a young boy, I believe his name was Cliff Miller. He was 12 years old. I don't know how that happened in the Georgia pen penitentiary system, but God placed him there. This young boy's mom worked at the penitentiary. His dad was a state policeman, and he would be out in the yard when they would let people out, inmates out to, for recreation and outdoor time. And young Cliff Miller had on a shirt that said something to the effect of the gospel about Jesus. And Morris read it and began to mock it. But the next day, young Cliff had on another shirt. And before long, this 12-year-old boy was witnessing to this hardened criminal. And Harold Morris became a believer in Christ. Subsequent to that, God freed him from prison, and he was used in tens of thousands of people's lives to share the gospel of Christ. That happened through one boy who was in a place he probably shouldn't be, and in these days probably wouldn't be, but God put him there to impact Harold Morris. Harold Morris saw something different. It didn't take handkerchiefs and aprons while it could have, but it does take Somebody committed to him. Are you that person? Is that your desire? Hey, let's not leave this earth without taking people with us. We can live this life. We can make our money. We can accomplish a lot of things. But if we don't take people with us, we're missing a blessing. You take that word as God puts in your heart. It may be, be to begin to pray for somebody. It may be to witness to somebody. It may be to say, God, help me to bear the fruit of the Spirit so when people see me, they'll see something different as the people in Ephesus. But it's God's desire. We live a magnetic life. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, we thank you for this example of Paul, a committed believer on his third trip still doing the work in spite of all of the adversity. And Lord, that the people saw him. And the scripture said that while they feared what was going on, because of Paul, they esteemed Jesus. Father, he was different. He was different from the seven sons of Sceva. And it was very evident. And Lord, when we live our lives under your power, under your guidance, people will see a difference and Lord, it would draw them to you. And so Lord, help us to be those type of people, stars shining in the night, knowing that it is you who is working in us to produce the works that would draw people to you. And Lord, we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.